Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Allure of the Poor, sponsored by Dracina Wines. Today I am sitting down with Doug Frost, and I, I honestly don't know what to say because, you know, people say to me, Lori, how do you write a blog, have a business, you know, uh, have a full-time job, have a podcast, do all this. Doug, you make me feel tired with all of you, everything that, that you do. So Doug is actually one of only four people who is both a master sommelier and a master of wine. And I don't know, I think either one of those is a lot to, to study and a lot to keep up with and all that, but, but you're doing them both. So first of all, welcome and thank you for joining me. So... Well, thank you very much, Lori. It's, it's my pleasure. Thanks. Okay. And so I'm going to start off with that right off the bat. Is So are you just so much in love with wine and mm -hmm. education that you just keep going back? Or is it kind of like a little, you know, you know, self mask case, you know, like, you know, I just kind of torture myself and I'll just do a little bit more, do a little bit more. <laughs> well, um, it, it certainly is uh, that I enjoyed... Um, and I put it in the past tense uh, because thankfully, you know, once you get those, uh, finish those examinations and get those titles, you don't have to come back and do it again, you know. Um, but I really, really enjoyed the education side of it. I, it took me, and I, I always tell students this as well, that don't be surprised if after you passed, you're still uh, addicted to the, the process of, of studying and gathering information and all that. It, it became... Uh, an, it, something of an addiction, and I don't mind that addiction. I mean, it was a nice thing, but at some point, I, I did have to really, you know, stop. Let's let's move on. We have other things to do. You finish the damned exams, move on. Um, but it, it was uh, it was many years ago, and and it was a crazy time for me. I actually had started a wholesale company during that time. Uh, my wife and I had our second child, and I took both exams at the same time, which is an incredibly stupid idea. Um, but I think or that, brilliant or brilliant because well, you're only studying I, once. <laughs> I know, I guess, you know, it's just that they're so they're so very different. They're both um, very different slices of, of of the same, you know, set of informations, but they're they're so radically different. And, and uh, so I don't know. I don't know if it's a good idea, bad idea, but it's the old like being kicked in the head. It's really great when it's over. Yeah, I'm sure you were like, I passed, I passed. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Which one? When came first? Which results came back first? I uh, I passed the Master of Sommelier in '91, and then I passed the Master of Wine in '93. Oh, okay, awesome. That so is a long wonderful. time ago. And, I'm one of the old farts. So <laughs> it is. It really is incredible. Um, I I'm WSET, and I mm -hmm. think about what that you know the amount of studying it takes for that, or at least I put in for that because mm -hmm. you know I'm. I'm crazy, you know, I can't just pass anything, you know, if, if it's not, you know, you know, with distinction, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. yeah, I need, I need to, you know, I need to um, compete against myself more than anything else. Uh, so I can't imagine studying for both of those um, separately, never mind at the same time. And then it must have been, I, I mean, was there champagne popping in the house when, when the results came back? Like... <laughs> Did you sleep um, for a week? <laughs> yeah, no, the, the Master Sommelier, I found out that I had passed um, when I was in London where I took the, the final exam. And so we, uh, Scott Carney, uh, another Master Sommelier, he and I passed uh, together in London. And one of my closest friends, Bob Bath, passed two of his uh, three sections in London. So we partied like lords uh, that <laughs> night. And it was one of those things where I, I, I told the guys, this is going to be a good night because we're in London where the, the hotel bar actually doesn't close until we go to bed. So it did not close that night. <laughs> <laughs> good for you. Good for yeah. you. <laughs> and then I remember when I passed the MW, it, it comes across as a fax from London. And I knew, it was, I knew what day it was going to come across. And I went into work early. I was a, a, a sales manager for a wholesale company. And so I showed up at about 6.45, uh, 
in the morning at the uh, office, which was not my normal hour, uh, and I was all by myself, you know, just working at my desk when I hear the, you know, like that, and, and I just kind of sat there and just thought, I just, you know, might be a different fax, you don't know, and, you know, walked out, and, and I'll, I'll never really forget that, because I picked the fax off of there, and I looked at it, and I went back to my desk and, and just folded it up and set it aside and, and kept working, and... Um, you know, finally, as people came into the office, uh, one or two people a few hours later were like, you haven't got any news, have you? And it's like, um, maybe, you know. <laughs> it was, you know, at that point, it's just such a, you've internalized so much and you've spent so many years working on it that you just kind of do the, all right, okay, good. I'm done with that. Now, I need to yeah. focus on what it is I'm doing right now because that was then, you know. So it Did was, you keep it was that fact? Crazy. Did you keep uh, that fact? You know, I don't know if I have that fax. That's a really, it's got to be somewhere. I mean, you ask my wife on that one. She's going to be like, excuse me, it's everything. It's here somewhere. So, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, so it's somewhere. I don't know. It's a long time ago. Um, so one of the first questions I, actually, it's usually the first question, but I was so blown away by everything you do that it got pushed to the second question, is the origin story. So how did you fall in love with wine? What was, what, what was triggered in your life that you're like, you know what, wine is where I want to be? Yeah, it's it's a distinctive experience for me. Um, the first glass of wine I ever had, I was 15 years old, and I was at. Uh, we were all at my uncle's house. We would go out at Christmas time to celebrate. We lived in the Midwest, but the family's all in the Bay Area. And um, I remember my uncle. Oh, for God's sake! Sorry about that. I remember my uncle saying, um, you know, just as sort of a joke. We're sitting down to dinner. Doug, you want to help me pick the wine? And, you know, when you're 15, you're like, well, sure, you know. And so he, I remember distinctly, we went downstairs and he had a wine cellar. And, of course, bear in mind, this was like five cases of wine. But I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, I've only seen this stuff in movies, you know. My, my family didn't, quote, unquote, drink, although my dad um, would come home from work. And we'd go in the kitchen and you would hear a glass clinking with ice and a cupboard, you know, opening and then closing. And then a couple of seconds later, you would hear a glass being washed out. And then he would come into the family room in a much better mood than when he went <laughs> in the kitchen. Um, and so anyway, you know, so we didn't really see that kind of stuff. And um, he took me downstairs and he explained to me the difference between Cabernet Sauvignon and Pinot Noir. And I never really forgot it. And, and you know, he explained that Cabernet was the king of wines and the wine most people think is the, the wine you should sell her and blah, blah, blah. You know, and he said, but some people think Pinot Noir is more interesting because it's more elegant and more nuanced and more subtle. And, you know, as a 15 year old, I remember distinctly thinking, well, that's me. I'm, I'm subtle, you know, <laughs> nuanced. <laughs> so we picked um, a 1968 Louis Martini special select Pinot Noir. And, and I had it, you know, wow. I had a glass of that. And I thought, is this what wine is? This is amazing. Uh, I just, it really was, it really caught me up. And, um, and then, I'm not really, again, around wine until I'm working in restaurants at, at uh, you know, what, five, well, four years later. And, uh, and, and suddenly I'm around, around wine again. And I went to work at a restaurant uh, in Kansas City where the wine steward was a guy named John Scupney, who now oh, owns Langley Winery. Yeah, exactly. Uh, he's, and he took me, uh, he, he said, hey, you know, you, you seem to be pretty good with wine. And I was like, I don't know anything about wine. I'm selling wine. But, you know, on the restaurant floor as a waiter, he said, well, why don't you come to a wine tasting? And he started taking me to wine tastings. And that was really that moment. I remember, in fact, walking into a room after, like, going to my third wine tasting and smelling something in the room and thinking, well, what's that? It was like somebody had given me another sense that I didn't know that I had. I, I, it was a distinct impression of, I can smell things. Well, what's going on? You know, it was, it was yeah. weird. Yeah. So wow, it, it to was, have to have John Scuffney be your uh, kind of uh, leader through the world is not too shabby. <laughs> absolutely, he was absolutely my first mentor, and and there was in Kansas City there were a bunch of people who were really smart about wine and had a bunch of cool wines. And back then, you know, you could it'd be like, hey, let's let's drink, let's see what a Lafitte tastes like. Everybody threw a twenty on the table. You know, you could do that back then. And, and I was yeah. a waiter, so, yeah, I got 20s. You know, let's go. 
And um, and so, yeah, I feel like I had really good mentors amongst them. You know, the first was John. And then how long, so that was like you were 21 Ish, I'm ho- I'm assuming yeah. since you were yeah you were 21-ish, yeah. And then, 21 ish yeah yeah I think it was 21 still yeah so it was it's been a it's been part of your life for for a large portion of your life and oh yeah really my entire life. adult life and and uh, just started going to wine tastings and we always blind tasted each other on stuff and and eventually. Um, I, I was at a hotel and I was the hotel wine buyer and then I got offered a job as a wholesaler and, and it was really pretty much, you know, it was, I, I was fully in. That's wonderful. I think about, um, you know, you were saying you throw down a 20 and the wines you can taste. That's not, that's not so, not so true or not so easy not anymore. Not so true anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I know that when my eyes got, Oh, I should say reopened because I fell in love with wine a long, long time ago. But the blog won the Melissa May Award, and I, as my reward, I got to go to Bordeaux. And right on. I have to say, it is probably uh, my husband's biggest nightmare the fact that I won that <laughs> award because our cellar used to be all California, Oregon, Washington, and now. There's a lot of Bordeaux. <laughs> there yeah. is a lot of Bordeaux. As in there it. should be. As <laughs> yes. There should. yes. And I get all excited when, you know, I'm like, okay, we're, we're buying more. And he's like, oh, God. He's like, why did you have to write that blog? You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, but then when we open it, he's pretty darn happy. Uh, exactly. We just celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary. Oh, and, congrats. Uh, we had a 95. And oh, he was yeah. like, okay. Like, okay. Good, good vintage, so, solid yeah. vintage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so to go back to you, on top of your master sommelier and master wine, you've written books. You, yeah, <laughs> like, wh- where are you finding time? What are these books? Uh, I'm assuming they're wine. Um, yeah. Actually, I know they're wine. I read what the titles were. Um, <laughs> but you also have won an Emmy Award for, um, yeah, they're, they're for such a Men's thing Nation. That- yeah, there's such a thing as uh, the Emmy Awards also um, uh, include, quote unquote, uh, regional Emmy. So it was, a, it was the Mid American uh, area, with, you know, of, of the U.S. And they have their own Emmy Awards, and 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 actually I won a couple of them, which was was great fun because um, it, it started out with the public rate, uh, public, pardon me, the public TV station in in Kansas City created, uh, or or I should say, took on a show called Check Please, which started in Chicago. They wanted to do one here in Kansas City. And and my good friend Alpina Singh, who was the host in Chicago, said, well, why don't you go talk to Dougie? And, and you know, so they uh, brought me in to do that. And that was a ton of fun. But it, at some point that ended. And I said, well, why don't we do some little feature pieces about alcohol? And, and we called them Permit Nation. And they were anywhere between five and 15 minutes long. So they'd fit into a magazine form. Format. And um, it was great fun because the, the uh, first year we submitted one uh, episode, it won an Emmy. And the, the, the second year we were doing this, we submitted one episode, it won an Emmy. I was kind of like two for two. Two for two. Cool. Yeah. And uh, it's funny hardware to have on the on the uh, the shelf in the in the family room. It's you know people every now and then somebody will walk in and go, what is that? And I'm like. That's what it looks like, man. You know, and you're like, where'd you get that? You know, I'm like, I know, weird, huh? You know? <laughs> so, but I mean, the second one, uh, let's just, uh, if if somebody wonders what they were like, just imagine that I was dra- I was dressed up in a costume like a cluster of grapes. So this is not really highbrow stuff here. You know, we're, oh. we're, we're we were trying to have some damn fun with it. So. Well, it was Emmy worthy, so that's awesome. <laughs> Somebody do, thought so. Do, do, do they have um, an award assembly? Uh, or, you know, an award. Um, oh vote? yeah, ceremony. Oh yeah, there's yeah. like 500 people there. You know, people from from multiple states and and such. And uh, and so that was weird. I didn't go to the first one because I thought oh. there's no <laughs> way I'm winning. And and I have to say, I was so pleased. The guy who. Um, accepted the award on my behalf was kind of the, uh, not kind of, but he was the one who built all the sets for the public uh, TV station and helped me with some of the costume stuff and, and set building and things like that. And Matt was like, kind of like, you know, salt of the earth guy who, who helped really uh, uh, 
help me do you know these crazy ideas that I had in my head. And so he was the he was the one that accepted the award on my on my, my behalf, and I was quite pleased. But the second one, I showed up at and and uh, actually did the wow, this is weird. <laughs> yeah. But you were you not in your grape cluster outfit. No, no. I, I wore the tuxedo <laughs> and the whole 10 yards, you know. That's fantastic. So what about your books? What are you, you've written three books. Are are they like on Amazon? What what are they? Do yeah, they focus yeah, you on can, three different things? Yeah, you can, you can certainly find them there. The, um, the, the first book was a, a, a primer and it dates back to the mid-90s. So it's, it's just a, it was a simple book and it was uh, originally intended really just to be for servers of the world and, and you know, to say, here, here's 100 pages. You can do this in an afternoon and now you know a little bit about everything that you need to know about. Um, the second book was a much bigger book, lots of, pic- you know, lots of pictures. That was always my favorite thing. People would be like, oh, I love your book. It's so wonderful. I'm like, cool. What's your kind of your favorite part in there? Oh, the pictures. And they're sure. beautiful. And I'm always like, you know, I didn't write the pictures but thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, but um, so that that that's around. That's just called on wine, and it, it was far more uh, you know extensive. I was trying to basically, I, I wrote it in sort of response to um, um, what I perceived as as an over reliance on uh, for most wine books on just the the dozen popular grapes. So I was like, I'm going to do 112 grapes. And talk about them and how they manifest and what they taste like in different countries or in different regions and all that. Um, and I, I love telling this story. That book came out on September 10th, 2001. Um, if I had named that book The Wines of Afghanistan, I think I would have been a big hit. But my timing was not ideal. So you can still find that one around somewhere. <laughs> and, then, and then the third book is is just about the wines of Spain. And, and uh, that that uh, has Spanish wine has always been a passion for me as well. So that was really fun to do. And that that's that hit third printing before it just now is just online. Uh, lives online, but you know, again, you can find these things around. And I have a couple of, of book projects that um, maybe, maybe in November um, in the I can get to. Yeah, I mean, I just finished just finished uh, harvest in Walla Walla, so um, I'll be back a couple of times before the end of the year. But but theoretically, I have a little more free time on my hands now that harvest is almost over. Well, well harvest is over, over, but now the right. winemaking process is. We've almost barreled down all the wines. So. All right. Um, and then before we get into the wine and all of that, you also are an educator. You have a, a bar, right? So that's for spirits. So yeah. you are all over. So. Hey, if so there's booze in it, I want to know about real, it. It's for you. <laughs> I like it. I like the way you think. I like the way you think. So, so uh, that's wonderful. Uh, I have to honestly say the spirit aspect for me is a little tougher. I don't have a I don't really have the palate yet. I, I'll never say, you know, never, but <laughs> with you, I'm willing to try, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. but that that was the tough part for the for the W S E T for me was sure. the spirits and all of that. Um just even tasting I, I I'm a wine and beer person, you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm always happy with a glass of wine in my hand and, you know, pour me an IPA, a hazy IPA and I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm in my happy place. So yeah. spirits is a, is a little tough for, for me, for my palate. It's been, like um, it's, it's funny the the working on the spirits and cocktail side has been incredibly um, rewarding for me as well. And, and I have to say, it, uh, my wife will be angry with the story I'm about to share, but my wife a long time ago decided that um, all my wine friends are kind of annoying and always, you know, try to one up each other. And I'm like, no, 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 we're just talking. She's like, no. What did you just say to your friend when when he said that he thought that 95 Bordeaux was so good? What did you say to him? I was like, well, I just said I agree. And he said, no. She's like, no. You said, oh, you should try the 96. It's even better. She's like, why do you people have to do this? <laughs> like, no, we're not doing that. You know? And, and, and maybe, it, maybe it's critical that she was a cocktail waitress when I first met her. Um, but she's like, no, you know, your, your, your uh, bartending friends, they're so much nicer. They never do that kind of stuff. And I'm like, no, it might be true. <laughs> I don't know, mm. you know, but I, I enjoy the company of, of all my friends, and, and I do feel sometimes like it, they're slightly different worlds. 
Yeah, I I can see it. I can see it. The the I guess it's a personality type thing, you know. Um, yeah. I'm like I wouldn't have actually thought about it, but now that you're saying it, I can, you know, I can think about. It. I think about my friends who are, you know, will come to the house and do a mixed drink, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm perfectly happy with them and they're wonderful friends. But then I think of the people who we have a dinner party with who are bringing, you know, wine. And, they, you know, they can get along, but they're not exactly, you know, what I think they're, you know there's <laughs> yeah. differences. There are. You're yeah. absolutely yeah. right. You're absolutely yeah. right. It's funny. <laughs> All right. So let, let's get into wine. Let's talk about um, Echo Lands. So okay. you're from Kansas City, but Echo Lands is in Walla Walla. Right? Yes. So first, where, um, how did we get to Walla Walla? How did, you, how did you get to Walla Walla? How did you get to Echo Lands? Um, when did this all start? Yeah, um, well, I, as, a, as somebody who was in the wholesale business dating all the way back to the early 80s, um, I started going to Walla Walla in the mid-80s and visiting wineries there like, you know, Rick Small at Woodward Canyon and such. And then uh, Leonetti uh, gets going and, and uh, you know, more and more. Um, but I, I would go there on a regular basis because I, I had interest in the wines. Um, I always, I think, focused more in the Pacific Northwest than maybe some of my colleagues did. So Oregon was, I started bringing Oregon wines into the Kansas City market. I brought 13 Oregon wineries into the KC market in in 85 and immediately was interested in bringing in Washington wines as well. Kind of thought, you know, that's a fun place to be. Um, And it was, it was relatively new territory in the 80s. Um, I fell in really in in with a group of of kids there. You know, I I was a kid then too, but fell in with a group of kids that, that who were starting wineries or making wine. And they were just great people, and I continued to to travel a lot to both Oregon and Washington. But um, when it came time to start this winery, um, I had only uh, one business partner, somebody who. Um, had been helping support some of the charities that I, I work with here in Kansas City and, you know, was one of those people that when we need a check written for, you know, whatever event, Brad would be like, all right, I'm your guy. I'll write that check. And so when he said, you know, if, if anything ever comes up that you think you want to buy something, you know, you need to tell me about that. And I felt a great degree of trust because we had worked together for, for some years on these various charities, you know, more than more than two. And, you know, and so I thought, OK, well, I will. And, and the funny part about it is when he had that conversation with me was right after I had been offered a, a very small uh, piece of a vineyard, existing vineyard in Walla Walla, Washington. And I knew that the uh, it was like a partnership and I knew most of the other partners. And I thought, well, this isn't very much money. I'm just being offered a little tiny piece of it and went to my wife and asked her and she's like, that's a terrible idea, but that's the money you got from your dad. You know, if you want to do that, you go ahead and do something stupid like that, you know? And so I, I said, yeah, I'm going to do it. And immediately, uh, I don't know, I, I've never asked who, but one of the other partners said, you know, we're a partnership. We already had too many partners. We're rid of one partner now because one guy was retiring. No. The answer is no, Doug doesn't get to buy that piece. We just divvy it up amongst ourselves. And I thought, well, you know, I'm from Kansas City. What the hell? You know, so I really wasn't too mad about it. But Norm McKibben, who's kind of really in, in many ways one of the, the pioneers of, of Walla Walla, uh, Washington, in, in, in its, its viticultural um, present and past, Norm calls me up and he's like, hey, I heard what happened. And, and I think you got a rotten deal. And I was just like, wow, Norm McKibben's calling me up, you know, Ooh, cool. I've only talked to him like twice in my life, you know, and I was like, ah, it's OK, man. You know, I probably didn't know what I was doing anyway. And he said, well, how about if I sell you some land? And I was like, really? And he owns or co-owns this huge project where this vineyard was. And he's like, why don't you come on up here and choose a different piece? I got I got parcels to sell. Uh, no. wow. And so that's the point at which I went to Brad and said, I got a crazy opportunity here. Um, I'm going to go up there and look around. And, Remember and, when you said, let yeah, me Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly that. So um, so that just kind of, the pieces all fell together. And, and it really was, at that point, just, I'm just going to buy this property. It wasn't planted at all. It was just fallow land. Mm-hmm. I'm going to plant this property. I'm going to try to develop a vineyard there. And then we'll see what happens. 
but you know that's going to take four or five years and we spent the first two years just plowing stuff in into the soils to try to build up the biome there and uh, before we even planted anything and meanwhile in all of this Greg Harrington of Gramercy Cellars is he's a friend he's somebody I worked with on the board at Quartermaster Smollies for years and trust him implicitly and he and so he knew what was going on I told him all about this um, and so in like uh, January of, of uh, 18 I, I'm up there and I'm you know we're sitting around tasting some wine at the at Gramercy and he said said you you did it and I was like yeah no it's done man I signed the paperwork this morning and he's like all right sit down and I was like okay and he's like sit down you're gonna be drinking from fire hose right now you're gonna be making wine in the fall I'm like no 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 see it's not even a vineyard yet he said shut up you're going to be making wine in the fall. I'm like, no, you see, I don't have any, no, no. See, we haven't even planted it. He's like, shut up. I'm going to cut you loose some Lake Colleen Syrah. You can use some of that to make the, your first wine. I was like, wait, what? That's your favorite vineyard. You're going to give me a, a, a piece of it? He said, yeah, I'll give you a block. I'll give you half a block. You know, and it's, it's like all of a sudden I'm making wine in 18. And, and uh, he introduced me to a young uh, enologist that he had worked with for years named Taylor Oswald. And Taylor and I sat down and, talked and talked and talked and you know drank a lot of bottles of wine to kind of see where each other was coming from and I was like dude you're my winemaker let's go and um and and that's it we're still the, 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 the we're still the entire staff me and Taylor you know? there you so, go yeah so um the echo lands uh I love the name and I when I heard it, something popped in my head. But I've learned not to ask, not to not to say my answer first, um, <laughs> because I'm usually wrong. But so explain where does Echo Lands the the name come from? Well, I, I uh, as you can imagine, we kicked around a lot of names. Um, names are hard to come by anymore. You know, oh, they're, tell me they're about all it. Taken. So I was. Oh, I was, they're also they're tough to just think of things. You know, you want something yeah. significant, but you don't want something. You know, it's. Yeah. Oh no. I mean, we went through the iteration of of using my name or Brad's name or our names to get you know all that stuff, um, and 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 to some degree, it was standing in the vineyard itself before it was planted, and it's a long um, a long vineyard that goes from about 1,200 feet down to 900 feet or so elevation, and there's a, a sort of canyon in front of it. So it, there is a, you know, an echo, if you will. Huh? But I immediately thought of it because of I'm here in Kansas City. It's a thousand miles away there. So the best I can say is it's a sort of echo of, of you know, the efforts of Taylor, who lives in Walla Walla, and me, who lives here. Um, so I thought that was appropriate. And then actually, as I, as I teased it out, I, I certainly thought to myself how, you know, the, the myth of echo, which dates back to, which comes from Ovid's Metamorphosis, where we get a lot of our, our mythology. And um, echo was, of course, a, a spry, you know, being who wanted to take corporal, cor, uh, corporal form so that she could express her love to this youth that she was in love with. But the rule was she could only repeat what the youth said to her. And, and I always, I, you know, I certainly feel like that's an apt metaphor for the, um, for the winemaking process, you know, you don't get to say something new. All you can do is is repeat what the grapes say to you. I certainly, as a as somebody involved in in winemaking, believe that it's wrong to try to to say something different than what the grapes say. You you know, as most any winemaker will say, all I, all you can do is screw it up. You know, you can't add anything to the wines per se. All you can do is screw them up, screw up what they're trying to tell you. So so I, I liked that image as well. And then, of course, I have to, have to give credit to a friend of mine who, who's like, here's this whole thing and then says, hey, Frost, what is wrong with you? Walla Walla, it's an echo. And I was like, oh, what do you think about that? But now, but now, see, that's the real reason why. That's why. There you go. There yeah. you go. So <laughs> I was sort of kind of close. I was thinking that wine echoes what the land gives. Exactly. So, yeah. So I, I was I was kind of right there, but I do like the Walla Walla as an echo. Yeah, but no, you're precisely <laughs> right. Wine is, a, you know, an echo of the land, and it usually isn't quite as vigorous and strong a message as the original message is. And I, I think, in that sense, it's it's a it's a good way to think about wine. Now you had said that your you you your first vintage was 2018 with yes. sourced fruit, um, yes, and. Uh, you have one vineyard, the 
the in the Savan. Am I saying that correctly? Yeah, in the Savane project. Yeah, Savane it's project. A, yeah, it's a, a project 19. with a lot of owners there. Yeah, in, oh, in, okay. and we planted in 19, yeah. And um, so we'll get a crop in 2022. Okay, so that's what I was going to ask. So you have the one, the save-in, which you planted in 2019, and then and that, that you called the Taggart Vineyard? Yes, right. Um, right. it's named after my, um, my maternal grandfather, um, who was really the only grandfather I knew. Um, and he grew up in Wenatchee, which is not too far away. Um, uh, my my mom was born in Tacoma, Washington. You know, my mom's side of the family uh, has lived and uh, lived in that part of the country in, in Washington State for many years. And um, in fact, the most famed hotel of Walla Walla is called the Marcus Whitman. Her aunt used to run it, and her aunt and uncle. Um, there's a building downtown right next to um, the, the restaurant I you know, get my lunch at all the time called the Struthers Building. That's, that was my mom's aunt's uh, family. And, and so you know, we're, there's a whole bunch of us, uh, or, or a whole bunch of my ancestors, I guess, and, and uh, distant cousins who are in the area. And, and Taggart, I just you know, I wanted to name it after my grandfather um, in so much as he was a baker by trade, and he taught me to taste things. Um, as a little kid, my, my earliest memories with him, and of course he lived in California, we lived in, in the Midwest, but we would see him a couple, maybe a couple times a year. And as a baker, I remember he taught me how to differentiate different uh, types of apples. Um, he was, in, in particular, Gravenstein apples were like, oh my God, you know, we get to California, we get to have Gravensteins again. Uh, because by that time he lived in, in Santa Rosa and then he lived in, uh, in Sebastopol. And then, you know, I mean, it was like um, the, the family was always there. And, and so in a way he taught me to, to, to taste. Uh, and so I felt like really, I really wanted to give, um, you know, the, the, that credit back to him. Oh, that's that's nice. I like that story. That's nice. Um, then your second vineyard that you're planting at the moment is Mill Creek. Right? Yes, we're in, in an area we're just calling Mill Creek because it's right off Mill Creek Road. Um, there is already a Mill Creek vineyard, so um, okay. we're not sure we're, what we're going to call it yet. <laughs> okay. So. Now, how do those two vineyards, How well, first of all, how far apart are those two vineyards? Yeah, they're about, um, I would guess, about 15 miles apart. So okay. um, Walla Walla Valley is, is a big, you know, valley that, that um, uh, it's bisected almost in the middle by the state line uh, between Washington and Oregon. Um, and so Taggart's on the Oregon side. And then um, the, the vineyard that will plant uh, off Mill Creek Road is on the north end of uh, Walla Walla. So all the way to the other end of the valley. And... Um, they're very different in, in, in a impact on, on the grapevines. I would say that the Savane is called the Savane Water Project because that part of Walla Walla, you better have water because it is dry. It's really dry yeah. down there. And the, the Mill Creek side, um, or you know, what may end up being called something like that, is actually a bit cooler, a bit wetter. You don't necessarily have to irrigate up there. You definitely have to irrigate um, down south. In the southern part of Walla Walla, so they're they're very different. And, and a simplistic way to look at it is, in a hot year, I'm going to be really happy we have vineyards in Mill Creek. In a in a cold year, I'm going to be very happy we have okay. vineyards uh, down in Savane. Okay, covering all bases. It's a smart move. <laughs> yeah, yeah, trying to. So now I looked online, and you are currently producing two wines. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they're from your source, your friend sourced, right? Um, and are they 2018 vintage? Because it's a Syrah and a red blend, correct? Yeah. Actually, what we have in, in 18, as you say, we have a Syrah from Lake Colleen Vineyard, which is certainly one of the, the heralded Syrah vineyards in, in uh, Washington State, if, if not other grapes, too. Um, but, but yeah, we got one of the uh, Syrah blocks that Greg was willing to, to uh, give up for us. And um, that's kind of a more elevated site. It's certainly, a, again, a cooler site because that's more in keeping with the style I wanted to create. And then the, the Bordeaux blend is from Seven Hills Vineyard, one of the great old, maybe the oldest vineyard in, oh. in uh, uh, Washington State. And we chose that because it's right next door to Taggart. And so it seemed to me that since we're going to be waiting a few years for Taggart, the smartest thing we can do is learn from the area. 
and um, it's it's been you know they're very different sites and it's been it's been a really good learning process um, we did make in 19 two additional wines so we uh, were offered I, I asked around and we were offered a little bit of Grenache from a rocks district uh, vineyard and I wanted to make not a typical rocks Grenache which I find big and, and sometimes a bit alcoholic and sometimes a bit um, low in acid so we just harvested it early and then we uh, put it in uh, stainless steel drums like a beer and we finished about a third of it in old old puncheons uh, just to kind of soften out some of the edges so it's a bit of a fruit bomb and and looking at it and tasting it you could almost be forgiven for thinking it's it's a, a friendly Pinot Noir um, so that was that was kind of fun and then uh, in 19 as well, and, and of course in 20 as well, um, in, in addition to that Grenache, we also, um, we had gotten some Cabernet Franc from two different blocks in Seven Hills, and one of the Cab Francs was just not hitting it. And so in 18, we actually just threw it away. And then in 19, I thought, well, this is dumb. You know, we're this throwing wine away is a bad business deal. Um, since we're never, or at least we're not, uh, happy with the wine up to now with that Cab Franc, let's make it into a pet nat. So we harvest yeah. early and turn it into a, you know, a sparkling pet nat and we disgorge Ooh, that it. That sounds and, very uh, intriguing. It's, it's fun. It's fun. You know, I wouldn't make any claims that it's a serious wine by any means. I think the Syrah and the, the Seven Hills um, blend are, you know, trying to be serious wines, but the Grenache is crushable and uh, the pet net is crushable. You know, it's, it's the kind of wine you want to throw down. So nice. and I think wine should do that too, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> in these vineyards, um, that's really what um, I wanted to get down and dirty about is these vineyards. Um, and the when you're planting a vineyard, uh, so you were brought to this vineyard and you're looking at the at the site. Are you thinking first – variety I want to plant? Does this vineyard match my variety? Or are you seeing the vineyard and then saying, all right, I have this vineyard. I like the site. I'm going to plant these varieties. Which Yeah, it's, do you for me, it's, yeah it's very much about, um, I mean, we wanted Syrah to be part of the project from the get-go. There's no Syrah planted in Taggart. I mean, I looked at that and thought, that ain't working. It's just no. So, for me, it's already proven as an area. We're right next to Bet's family, uh, which does some fantastic Bordeaux varieties from there. We're right below Leonetti, who obviously proven that site is pretty great. And, and the next, you know, a big hill, if you will, over is Ferguson that makes fantastic um, uh, Bordeaux variety wines for, for Le Col. And so it, it seemed obvious to me. So we planted Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, down at the bottom of the hill, a little bit of Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon, um, thinking two thoughts there, really, that one, um, it's cooler down there. Um, even if the heat sinks, we're, we're facing to the north, and so it's a bit cooler there. And if we get some, some Botrytis, um, that won't be the worst thing in the world on a little bit of Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon. The truth is, we're never going to get any Botrytis down there. I don't think there's a, a you know, snowflakes chance in hell that that'll happen. But, um, so we, we stuck with Bordeaux varieties there. And um, we, we have actually a couple of uh, hillsides um, that, that are not planted yet. Um, we've got some sections that haven't been planted. So Petit Verdot will get planted there because I've discovered that Petit Verdot is a really critical part of that Bordeaux variety uh, blend. Mm -hmm. And and those other hillsides, we, we've got some we got some plans there. But um, what we do up in Mill Creek may turn out to be quite different. And so when you're looking at these soils, are you you're, are you doing analysis of the soils? Are you are you know before planting? Did you drill down to the to the horizon layers and see what you got there? Yeah, you got to do soil pits. I mean, just if only to understand what you're dealing with and how things are different one spot from another. Having said that, a, a lot of Washington State and a lot of Walla Walla is it's almost like it's the same damn soils. Your your choices are pretty stark. Um, you're going to be scoured down to the basalt layer because the Missoula floods took everything away. And so there's chunks like that. Uh, and, and then there are uh, soils, and, and this is a lot of Walla Walla, but a lot of um, uh, other sites as well, 
are nothing but dust. It's loess, as the Austrians or, or the Germans would call it. And those loess soils are, are the result of the Missoula floods 15,000 years ago, throwing so much uh, soil up into the air, you know, as a 200 foot uh, wall of water carves its way across the Pacific Northwest for, for at, you know, 50 miles an hour. Um, all that stuff is still coming down to this day. And, and so most of the vineyards around there are like, you know, five foot, 10 foot, uh, layers of dust, and then down at the bottom will be a layer often of calcium carbonate. Um, then you get to your, to your basalt. And so it's, it's kind of those opportunities. Now, Lake Colleen also gets to what are called the old soils, and a lot of that is, is um, some of the, the old volcanic stuff that's been pitched and, and thrown back and forth and broken up. Um, but where we're at is, is a lot of the dust and the calcium carbonate, and then if you get low enough down to the basalt. Um, so you've got to put something into those soils otherwise it's like hydroponic viticulture you know there's just not much going on there and 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 so that's why we spent two years with the with taggart just putting green manure in there grow stuff till it under grow, grow stuff till it under just keep doing it until you can build something into living into that soil and are you uh now looking to be maybe not necessarily certified but biodynamic. I mean, if you're putting all of that into those soils, you obviously, once you start planting, you don't want to lose what you put in. So are you focusing on the biodynamic um, aspect we of are, it? Yeah, we very much are. Uh, thus far, we've been uh, fully organic. Whether or not we will ever try to be certified organic, I, I can't say. We're still, there's, that's still a lot of soul searching and, and arguing uh, to, to, to go. Um, did it with biodynamic. I've always respected it, but I also I also have to say, you know, there are parts of biodynamic um, viticulture that uh, allow chemi chemical inputs that people would be sort of shocked by, and so I, I just don't feel like an ideologue in this matter. I, I feel like I need to to take my time, learn what's going on, understand everything I can uh, from the people around me, and that's been my favorite part about Walla Walla. I've got all these mentors around me. And, and then make the best decisions we can. Um, but for now, you know, we've been absolutely no pesticides, no, you know, chemicals, no herbicides. And, and um, we'll, we'll see how this unfolds. I know what I wish I could wave a magic wand and, and have it be so. But I also know farming ain't like that. You know, farming, right. Mother Nature is in charge. And, mm -hmm. and you had better not get too arrogant and not try to lay down a marker um, that you can't live up to. So um, we'll see. Uh, certainly plan on doing the, the live and sustainable and salmon safe and all, you know, what are kind of the standard um, smart practices in, in uh, yeah. the Pacific Northwest. But um, I'm not, I'm still not absolutely uh, confident that biodynamic, fully biodynamic is for me. On the other hand, we want to use the teas. I really believe in, in the inputs that you get from biodynamic. I really do. Right. Absolutely do. When you started to say, you know, there's some things about biodynamics, I started laughing because I, there's a lot about biodynamics that just science makes sense, you know, yeah. and it's good. Yeah. But, you know, you can only stir X amount of times in the left direction on this day or, on, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, all right, you know what, not not happening, not happening. Yeah, uh, hang you know, on. I'm going to do, a, I'm gonna do a punch down when I'm going to do a punch down. I'm not going to wait, you know. <laughs> Um, yeah, and yeah. Uh, the there's an app um, called Which Wine. Oh yeah, got it. Do it's like, on here. It could, yeah. Like I have it on my phone, and it's kind of interest. Like I'm like, I don't really think I taste wine differently if it's a leaf day versus right. You know, so some of that stuff is a little too far yeah. out there. I'm not saying it's not right because I will never tell you know, but yeah, but. Some of it's a little bit out there for for me, being a science minded person. Um, I'm always willing to look at the science background behind it, but some some of the stuff is a little crazy. And although I, I agree with a lot of the concepts, again, the certification, it, it's dishing out money for for a certification that is. Do you really need that little emblem on your thing? How you know you at some point, especially when you're small, and right. every penny is counting for something. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, it is it is an interesting an interesting concept. I just I look at that app, the Witch Wine, just 
Like I'm like, all right, so am I drinking wine today? Of course I'm drinking wine, you know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly what? Yeah, a root day, I'm not going to have a glass of wine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Get out of my face, you know. Right, <laughs> right, <laughs> you know? right. Um, all right, so going back to the vineyards, uh, so here, here's my, here's a question. You see new vineyards being planted all the time um, for either, you know, the vineyard has been diseased or, or they're ripping up one variety to put on another one. What comes first? Are you, are you planting the vines and then putting in the trellises or are you putting in trellis first and then you're planting the vines? Yeah, um, it is possible that we'll have. We're looking at a couple of sites where we may be head pruned, uh, and, oh, okay. and there will be yeah, and there will be no you know architecture out there per se, uh, other than we'll probably have to put in architecture for the for a, you know drip irrigation just when they're young. Um, but for the rest, yeah, I always determine the the layout exactly how close we want everything to be, and the closer spacing, the better in general. Um, uh, but not always. It depends upon the, the clones and, you know, all these things. Um, so I put out the architecture first and then we, then we put the, the, the vines in. And um, for Taggart, we did pretty standard spacing. I mean, we did uh, somewhat uh, closer spacing, you know, six, six by six, and, and that sort of thing is not very unusual. And there are people up here doing, you know, uh, meter by meter. And I just... I don't know that we have a site where meter by meter makes sense. Um, we may have. They're, they're up in, in the Mill Creek Road uh, spot. There may be a, a site up there, but there, there's a lot of research. You know, there's a lot of thinking and, and talking and asking and reading that needs to happen before we're ready to, to, to bite that one off. Um, it seems to have an impact, but I'm, I'm, I'm still like, but I don't know why it would. I don't know why I have to do that. You know, there's a, just a lot I don't understand yet. And you're planting, if you're doing six by six, you're planting for hand harvesting. Yeah, we so far everything is hand harvested, and I would prefer uh, to to stay in that world. And um, thankfully, COVID has uh, not impacted labor so much that um, it has been a problem. But but on the the team, um, back in March, we lost one of the older members of the team to COVID early on. It was, you know, very sad. Oh, yeah, he was, he, you know, had plenty of family members um, who who worked on the, t uh, and the, the crew as well. And it was a really sad deal. So, and, and, you know, I have to say, I don't think we're done. You know, I think in many ways um, it may be, we may be in for a tough winter. Oh, I, I, I'm with you on that. I think, yeah. I think it's going to be a tough winter. Um, what are what are your thoughts on? I mean, you're saying you prefer hand harvesting. Uh, what are your thoughts of of the quality of a wine that is hand harvested versus the quality of a wine that is mechanically harvested? Do you think that there's a difference, or it's site specific, fruit specific? Yeah, I do think you're right. It's site specific. Um, the, the hand harvest helps a lot, particularly with Seven Hills. We get a lot of what are called jacks, which are um, Seven Hills just seems to, to produce those, which are, you know, the little uh, little stems basically off, off of your uh, clusters. And, and so hand harvesting seems to uh, minimize as much as we can that problem. Uh, machine harvesting in Seven Hills would be a, a mess. Um, I assume Taggart will be kind of the same animal depending upon, you know, clones and things like that. Um, whether or not we could ever machine harvest, I just don't think we're ever going to be big enough that that would ever even be a factor. Okay. And we, you know, hand sort everything. We do uh, no inoculate, native yeasts. Um, everything's, you know, when it comes to the Syrah, it's foot stomped. It's punched down by hand. When it comes to the, um, the Bordeaux varieties, we go ahead and de-stem, uh, you know, use a machine to de-stem and, and, uh, uh, and then uh, ferment it in tank. But again, I don't. We haven't had any need, generally speaking, to add any any yeast. We'll just what what's called pitch it. So we'll we'll uh, hand you know pick a bunch of grapes, crush them in a bucket, leave it out. You know let let nature start. Nature. And, yeah, and that's your you know that's your that's your mother as it were. And you dump it into one, and once it gets going, you dump it into the other, and you know keep everything going. So I haven't. I, I don't foresee a need for that. We're we're certainly never going to be big enough to, I think, justify machine harvesting. But 
never say never. I, I right. you know, there may be there may be a reason uh, we may dis- discover with climate change that we so desperately need to do night harvesting that a machine is is the best uh, method. I don't know. And now, what is your case production now? We're uh, this year we'll produce about four thousand cases. So oh, okay. we've uh, you know, yeah we've grown pretty fast. Um, but it, a lot of it has to do with Taggart is 25 acres planted. So there's a lot of fruit coming down the, you know, the track at me, and I'd better be ready and, and not suddenly have to be making 5,000 cases, and I've never done anything like that before. So, um, so we'll see how it goes. And where do you, like every winery has a sweet spot in their brain of where they would like to be. Um, do, you have, yeah. do you have that sweet spot where you'd be? Yeah, I, I I don't want to go over ten thousand cases. I, okay. I don't have any plans to go over ten thousand cases. I think that's a sweet spot, um, and I I hope I'm right in believing that that's going to continue to be a sweet spot for for years to come. And it, so you've got your Bordeaux varieties. Are you are are you in your brain thinking more BDX you know blends or or are you going to be a varietal uh, person. Yeah, we'll we'll keep for sure. We'll keep making Syrah Adelaide clean because I really love its elegance. Um, there, uh, the whole idea uh, from the get-go was that Cabernet Franc was supposed to be an, an integral part of what we were doing and in the blend. But the first uh, the first one that we made was uh, the 2018 is 40% Cabernet Sauvignon, 40% Merlot, and only 18% Cabernet Franc, which frankly reflects the fact that half the Cab Franc we got was just not up to scratch, you know, so got rid of it, and the next year said, to hell with it, you know, why bother, let's just make pet nat out of this stuff. Um, will, will, will I get back to that goal of third, 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 um, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot? I don't know, we'll, we'll see, we haven't done our 19 blends yet, everything is still separate right now, um, so I'll be doing that next month in December, um, but I will say this, because I was displeased with some of the Cap Franc we got and, and knew we had to find new sources, we went out and found new sources. And and there's one or two Cab Francs that are just, oh, my God, they're so good. that It's like they, every time you taste them, they're screaming at you going, put me in a bottle. Let me be by myself. <laughs> don't muck this up, young man. You know, don't screw this thing up. And and so yeah, I cannot imagine that in in um, 19 we won't have a standalone Cab Franc okay. because uh, there's just one that it's like it's screaming at me. It's so pretty. Why wouldn't you? You know, and and I guess it's also appropriate considering John Scupney was my first mentor and he's a, a absolute Cabernet Franc specialist that yeah. it would be kind of cool to be able to go, hey John, look what I learned. You know, here's mine. Right. You know? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I'm i the founder of Cab Franc Day, yeah. so I'm a, I'm a, you you're, know. You're behind me on this one. <laughs> we, yes, absolutely. Um, Push me. You know, Go. <laughs> and, you know, Dr- Dracina Wines, it, it, we are Cab Franc, you know, Dracina yeah. Wines is Cab Franc, we make two Cab Francs, um, and we've expanded to a white and where where do you go for white? You go to Shannon. If you're a Cab Franc maniac, you go to Shannon yeah. for your white. Yeah, hell yeah, um, that's a delightful grape. Okay, um, so I love hearing I love hearing that uh, you're, you're all for Cab Franc. So when you have your when you have your varietal Cab Franc, you you will have to participate in every year. I do the Cab Franc Day promotion. Promise. So, Promise. So. We will uh, we'll get you uh, we'll get you on the list so that it's ready for you when when you're ready. Um, all right, so back into the vineyard. Okay, mm-hmm. um, when you're planting, right? Say, so are you, you know, is it obviously not a day if it's 25 acres, but yeah. like, are you? Today's the day I am digging the holes for the posts. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Today is the day I'm doing this, or is it kind of like I'm going to do this block? from start to finish, this block start to finish, and how are you deciding your your blocks? Like, you know, when it's our, when the vineyard's all up, you know, oh, we got this block, this block, but how are you deciding what you're planting and what block? Yeah, it's, um, because we have this hill and uh, in Taggart, and, and the top of it is, um, 
I mean, particularly this year, we had a lot of wind damage in uh, at the top of the hill, and everybody who was exposed anywhere in Walla Walla at the top of the hill, and I, I mentioned Ferguson earlier, I mean, it's the poster child for this, just got the crap uh, beat out of it by the wind in May and June, and it screwed up flowering, and, and certainly probably, uh, well, you can look at the hill, and, and when you get up to the top, those plants are distinctly behind uh, the plants down in the, in the bottom or in the middle even. Um, so it, it was very much about, okay, Cabernet Sauvignon is going up top because it's a lot better at surviving uh, wind than Cap Franc or, or Merlot. So we have to do that. And then, of course, you just have that issue of practicality. A block has to be a certain size or you're just going to make the cruise insane. You know, if it's too big or if it's too small, you're asking people to do too much work in a, in a single day or, or uh, having to split the work up which is going to create problems uh, with even ripening, you know, so there's those practicality issues right. that, that come about. So um, I think we pushed it about as far as we could in terms of the various blocks. Um, we've got three different clones of Cab So, we've got two different clones of Cab Franc. We wanted three, but we couldn't get the third ditto on, on Merlot. And, and the idea for me was very much not necessarily that um, one clone is preferred over the other, though I'm told that I should, and I certainly have a personal preference about it. It was no, but I believe in a diversity of clonal material because I think that ultimately is going to do me better. The, the whole goal has been, can I make a wine that is Taggart, not a wine that's the separate you know, uh, varietal from Taggart and then another varietal that's from Taggart. It's can we make a wine that reflects this place? And, you know, will there be wines on the hill that don't fit into that? Yeah, of course. We're, you know, we're going to discover that. And, and I'm sure much to my chagrin as we go along. But it was very much about what is the, the smallest block that we can do uh, that doesn't make a crew insane. And, and to, to work with that in mind. And, uh, and yeah, so we shall see. Now, the crew doesn't hate me yet. Although I will admit that there was this moment when um, they said, you know, you really you succeeded at getting so much material in the in the soil that we're having trouble digging the the holes for the the um, the, the vines to go in, and they're all own rooted. Um, so we, oh. which you know, you can still do in 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 Washington in some places, although phylloxera is there. So you know, um, we shall see how that how that works. But um, that's yeah, an executive said, you know, decision, huh? Oh, there yeah. No, it's like, oy, oy, you know, but they some I actually got a phone call of, you know, it'd be so much easier if we could just drop some Roundup right in that little spot to kill off the all the stuff that's growing there to make the, the easier to dig the holes. And it's like, what part of no are you not no. getting? You know, it's like, <laughs> yet, <laughs> never. <laughs> that may, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. Wow, I, on own rootstock. I I know that Walla Walla is known to not really have the issue so much, but I got I got to give you credit for that. I'm not so sure I would uh, be so brave, um, you know, when you know if I was buying a vineyard and it was already planted on own rootstock. All right, you know, whatever. But we're going in. Ooh, that's that's brave. That's that's awesome. That's belief in what you got there and brave or stupid because um <laughs> literally we planted in may of 19 and in july of 19 phylloxera was, dis was discovered in the area and, <laughs> oh. and you know it was one of those all right well i kind of i kind of i mean when that decision was made i knew that was the risk and and the thing is is that despite what washington has tended to say about its own wines Phylloxera's always been there, and it, we've been lucky because of those weird soils we have, and I think because of the freeze, because of the climate that we have, that um, because it does freeze quite frequently there, um, that Phylloxera hasn't ever really gotten a foothold. It's probably not surprising that as the climate changes, Phylloxera is going, Goodness. oh, no, I can work here, too. Yeah. yeah. And, and so um, I, I think that the truth of the matter is, is that when it comes time to plant in Mill Creek, we will plant on rootstock. You know, we, we um, I recognize that I took a risk and, and I may get, you know, I may get uh, punished for that. It's like the old, uh, you know, the when you're coaching or whatever. So yesterday, big football fan, but uh, yesterday, uh, the Redskins, right? My husband's a Redskins fan. I can't stand him. I'm a Dolphins fan. But no. their coach 
right? Redskins versus Giants. They, he went for two at the end of the game. If he went right. for if he went for the extra point, and they would have tied the game going to overtime. He exactly. went for two. They could have right? won. They could have right? won. Yeah. But he lost by one point, yep. so it was the worst decision ever. But yes. If he had, if they had made those two points, that two point conversion, it would have been the uh, best decision, uh, the best coaching, you know. So yeah, that one I thought right? was, yeah, I thought that one was like, oh come on, man, you know. But oh well, yeah. everybody takes their risks. Uh, you know what? And he stood in front and he he stood up for his decision. He's like, yeah. I don't, I don't, you don't play to tie, you play to win. So, yeah, no, you should, you know? yeah. So there you go. Uh, more power to you. I get, I give you more power to you. Uh, all right, so uh, exactly, you said it's 25 acres, right? Mm-hmm. Or do you have 25 acres under vine? Yeah, it's a 50-acre piece. Okay. We have 25 acres under vine, um, and the the uh, the, the uh, goal is to have um, at least 15 or 20 acres of, di- of biodiversity um, because I, I really I have a strong belief that there's not enough of that going on, and um, it's it shouldn't just be... I don't want to criticize anybody, but I can't mention the number of times that I've visited somebody and I'm like, hey, what's going on over here? So, oh, well, you know, it's biodiversity. I'm like, that's a half an acre and you have 40 acres of vineyards. Tell me how that works at all. <laughs> um, you know, so, so and, and I have to say that one of the great disappointments, we were late in, in uh, 19 uh, uh, planting the, you know, quote unquote biodiversity, the, the, those various plants, which we are getting from uh, local nurseries, Native American nurseries, things like that. And so they didn't take very well. Um, uh-huh. They're doing OK this year. Things are looking better. And, and now it's time. You know, we've just uh, we're just in the process of mowing everything down again so it can all come back in the spring. And I, I think come back stronger than ever. Um, but we're still, you know, we still don't have um, bat boxes up and owl boxes, and um, th- there's uh, that we need bee boxes out there, and those mm-hmm. still aren't there. There's a lot of work left to do, but um, uh, you know, they, as far as I'm concerned, it's it's our responsibility to create a, an ecosystem there, or at least to support the existing ecosystem. You know, it is very different than California. It's a, it's a sagebrush ecosystem there, so it won't look you know, magical and beautiful and, and all that. But if we do it right, um, it will sustain, you know, life yeah. there. It will, right. it will provide, uh, you know, a safe environment for a, a lot of the, the natural flora and fauna. So you're, when you're planting, you obviously have to buy your vines. Mm-hmm. And you go to a nursery. How far mm-hmm. in advance? I mean, it's not like, somebody's going in their backyard and buying, you know, five vines or whatever, like 25 acres is, and that's just the tagger, right? You, you right. haven't, yeah. okay, so, so the Mill Creek is a whole other, how far in advance do you need to place your order in order to make sure you have the vines that you want? Yeah, pretty much 12 to 18 months for sure. Um, okay. And these days it's worse um, because, uh, because, the, the primary nurseries up there have not been up to now planting root, uh, you know, grafted vines. They're having to pivot. Uh, they've had to pivot uh, radically since 19. And so it could be, you know, you could be waiting two years to get the, the, the vines you want. And indeed, as I mentioned, the cl- I couldn't get all the clones I wanted. I was like, well, you list this clone. And they're like, yeah, it's sold out. I'm like, okay. well, when can I get it? Maybe in two or three years. You know, it's like, well, Okay. Put me down, but put me on I the need. list. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so it literally is like going through a catalog, picking it, and then being told, "Nope, sorry, sold out." We're going to <laughs> it. it is very much like that. It's very frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, so how about the uh, design of an, the orientation of of the vines? Uh, really important. Uh, and well, especially for Cab Franc, that orientation, <laughs> but. Um, you know, north, south, east, west, depending on the altitude, all of that. How are yeah. you? How do you come to the conclusion of I'm going to put these vines in what orientation? Did you decide? Yeah, um, uh, it, in Walla Walla, you don't want to be a, a, a strict north to south orientation. Um, you need to to build up the west side for sure because the sun's going to be harsher there. Um, so, you know, your vines maybe look a tiny bit lopsided when they're fully grown, but you need to be off of uh, a, a true north-south. 
just enough to deal with uh, with the sun. So we we argued around, you know, I, I played around with that for a while. We ended up um, between the, you know, around 13% off of, of true north-south. I think that's about right. Um, but everybody you talk to has a different idea, frankly, <laughs> you know. So Absolutely. at some point, I, yeah, yeah. At some point, I, I just had to say, well, this is what we're going to do. Um, what we're going to do in, uh, off Mill Creek Road, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm still really thinking that through. Um, we have about five sites up there that could be potential for for planting, and you know some are more east facing, some are more south facing, a couple of them are southwest. Um, so <laughs> I don't know. Um, we haven't even uh, come to a conclusion as to what grapes should be grown up there yet. Other than I know I've got to have some Cabernet Sauvignon in in one particular site that that's uh, that's south south uh, west facing. It's it's. Oh, well, southeast, I should say south, southeast, south, and south, southwest. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a great spot for Cab. You're, you're, you're drooling just thinking about it, aren't you? I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's really true. Uh, it, with, with the winters there, do you do anything special for the, for the young vines? I mean, I know... You know, yeah, we bury some, them. Some yeah. wineries are burying and things like that. Yeah. But kind of tough with, you know, is that what you're doing with the young vines also? Yeah, yeah, yeah you really have to. Um, the winters up there can just be too harsh. you you got to bury your, your uh, especially your young stuff. You really do. So we're still doing that uh, this year. And um, we'll see about next year. I'll, uh, my viticulturalist is a, a woman named Sadie Drury and um, Sadie has a lot of experience up there. Um, she's been managing Seven Hills itself. And so I trust Sadie implicitly on this. And, and um, so we've talked about it and she'll, we'll be varying this year. They're, they're at work on that right now, finishing up the trellising uh, at, that they can as the wood hardens off. And then, you know, once it gets cold enough to harden off, it's like bury them and, and see you in the spring. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to say thank you so much. It was so I I had a great time talking to you and, you know, it's I love talking about vines and, you know, I can always talk wine, but uh this is the first time that I've actually been able to talk to somebody literally about planting a vineyard. And so thank you for sharing all of that with me. And uh, just can you tell people where one they can find you personally on the socials and then tell us about Echoland. Sure, absolutely. Well, Echolands is, you know, at Echolands Wine for, for uh, uh, Twitter folks, and uh, echolandswinery.com is, is where you can go. And, and if you want to sign up for a newsletter, I do a monthly newsletter and talk about what's going on. I'm actually in the Twitter world, I'm at Wine Dog Boy um, because I, at, I just decided I didn't want my real name in there. I thought it would be uh, more fun to, to be a, a pseudonymous uh, character in there, but <laughs> uh, I'm actually at DougFrost.com uh, as well, so I'm I'm pretty easy to to hunt down and ditto in Facebook. Um, Echolands Winery is the, the you know you can find us on Facebook there, um, and and we're trying to you know offer people as much information as we can about what's going on because I'm learning, and I think that that's I hope that that's interesting to to some folks to, as you say, to to find out what these decisions are like and and what challenges we're seeing and and what you do and suddenly you go I just planted a vineyard and it's got potentially got phylloxera. Fortunately, we're, we're not even going to say it. Not even going to say it. Not even going to yeah, say it. Not going to say it. Not going to say it. Not going to say it. But yeah, it doesn't have it yet. But it's only a matter of time. And so you know, how do you deal with those? Uh, challenges for sure, but it is fun to um, be talking to a fellow Cabernet Franc lover because I think that's a pretty damned important grape. Thank it you is. for it is. time. Yep, so much more than a blending grape. That's what I've been saying since day one. Uh, more than uh, a blending yeah. grape. Well, yeah. I will get you that Blue Mountain Vineyard Cab Franc because I just it's it just sings to me every time I taste it. Oh, I would love that. I would appreciate it. that. Sounds amazing. There's a yeah. if you do, if you do a cellar tracker. Yeah, you know, there, there's a lot of cap frog in the cellar. <laughs> right on, yeah, exactly. You know, and the the pet gnat, I'm so that that sounds really that that. How much of that do you produce? <laughs> well, that's a that's a fun story uh, because we made about 90 cases worth of pet gnat in uh, 2019, and we uh, ended up having 21 for sale. So you can see there was some learning going on 
in the process of making pet nat you know it's it making sparkling wine is not like making still wine um, okay. in in 2020 we'll have the full complement of pet nat to sell <laughs> learn from had, the mistakes that's all you can learn, ask right <laughs> exactly just don't make the same mistakes twice you know? uh, well you know what it's good that you know you have you have an awesome personality and you have like you you have to be able to one learn from your mistakes and to laugh at them because oh yeah you know I, if, I mean you know I'm sure I'm sure there were some explicitives you know coming out of your mouth at some point <laughs> but you know in hindsight you can laugh at it and you know if life goes on and and now you can have more more pet net with the next vintage <laughs> yes we'll have more so for sure <laughs> um, and so people can buy online on your yes. on your site uh we are finally uh starting to cool down so shipping is now going and do you go to uh most states are you yeah, yeah. we're we're in most states um we actually have um a, a wholesaler in you know, the california market is northwest wines and uh in washington state it's elliott bay and uh it we're we're in my home uh markets not surprisingly but kansas and missouri and getting set up in north carolina with freedom and and so we're going to be uh, available you know through wholesalers but but yeah it, it's easiest uh to just to go to echolandswinery.com if you're really thirsty we'll, we'll get you something all right. Well, thank you so much, Doug. It was a pleasure to e-meet you, and I hope one day uh, we get to uh, meet in real life and uh, clink a glass or two or three together. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. Thank you so much for, for taking time as well. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a great week. Enjoy. Thank you. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.